Well, Keith, welcome to the show, my friend. It's great to visit with you today. Well, I'm happy to be here. My pleasure. So first thing I see you wearing this NUMA camo. Um, I just switched over to NUMA about three months ago. Yeah. And absolutely love it. Put it through the ringer in New Mexico. That's that's where you're joining us from today. You just wrapped up an elk hunt. Uh, yep. How long have you been working with NUMA? Oh, I guess close to a year, but I'll tell you this. Uh, I was never the kind of guy that got really sold on a, on a brand of camo mm -hmm. until Numa came along. And it's like, what happened was all of a sudden I started looking at the little things, you know, most people look at the pattern. Oh, that's a cool pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. A lot of cool patterns, but you know what? It's the little things. If you were wearing it, you know what I'm talking about? It's all the little things that went into the thought process. It's like, whoa. It, I mean, they, they are hunters. I mean, they developed this camouflage for serious hunters. And I mean, if, if a guy out there is like I was just think all camouflage the same, I think they need to check it out because it's not, I mean, from the yeah. buttons and the zippers and the pockets and the, they, they got, they figured it out. What I hate is you put on a pair of pants and you're like trying to find the, and look, I mean, look how big cell phones are today. Yeah. And then you can't find a pocket to put your stupid cell phones is basically the yep. size of a little computer. Uh, that's I was wearing those tenacity pants because when I was in New Mexico two weeks ago, it was hot as hell. It was like 85, 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. I was just south of where you are in Chama uh, yep. with those tenacity pants. Thank God I had those because anything heavier than that, I would have it would have been miserable walking around. Oh, I know. I know. But the pockets, I, I will tell you this, though, the the, uh, the 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 pants that our guide was using were covered up in cockle burrs and uh, mine weren't. So anyway. The, yeah, they think of everything. Numa's <laughs> thought of it all, so very yeah. happy with it. Um, so how was your how was your hunt? It was really good. I wound up. Uh, this is the I want to say sixth year I've been up here, and uh, I keep coming because the, the country's beautiful, and I love elk, and, and and I love them to talk and call them in and play the game. Unfortunately, this year they didn't play the game very well, so I sat at a water hole and I shot a nice six point there. And what the cool thing about it. The bull came in, I was rifle hunting. And, uh, and so the bull comes in, when I shoot him, he flipped over backwards and you broke an antler in half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Huh. Imagine that broken. Antler so you in found half. the, you found the antler though. Oh yeah. Right next to him, but it just shattered. <laughs> it. So anyway, we got some good video and I think that's that that's the name of the game for us. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, I'm sure the tax numbers can fix that right up anyway, or maybe you don't want them to uh, some people. No, like I'm going to, I'm going to fix it up. I, I'm going to fix it up, but it, okay. it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, well, I got to thinking about, and I think it was a conversation uh, you were, you were speaking, I think it was at the DSC convention. And I was thinking about the worst guided hunts that I've been on. And then one, this one that you talked, you mentioned there came to mind. And, and generally speaking, you know, you go on a guided hunt, it's a good experience most of the yeah. time. You know, but there are, I mean, you've been on hundreds. I, I've probably been on a hundred or so. Um, and I'd say 80% of them are, are good. You know, mm -hmm. and I, I chalk it up as I don't have to have the nicest accommodations, but I do, I do think that if you don't have a shot opportunity, that, that absolutely makes it not that great of an experience. Right. Um, you're there to, to kill an animal mm -hmm. at the end of the day, that's what we're doing. So you got to have a shot opportunity. If you get that shot opportunity, then I think after that, you're playing with house money, whether you screw it up or you, you know, you make the most of it. Um, but then there are other things that come into play, like, I don't know, um, guides not showing up. And these, like I said, these are not the norm, but it does happen. But this one that you, you mentioned, and I don't know, you guys, I think maybe you and your son went on a bear hunt, um, but the guy just woke up dead. Yeah, we wound up, um, first off, I, I mean, I've been on so many hunts that have been great, but there's some that are just nightmarish. And uh, this one hunt, I took my son and uh, we were black bear hunting up in Canada and they're nothing but a bunch of native Indians up there that were the guides. And mm -hmm. this one guy was drunk all the time. I mean, we showed up drunk and he stayed drunk. And, and finally the third day uh, I asked, I said, where's Greg to the, the outfitter. He says, Oh, uh, he's not here today. And I said, okay, fine. The next day he said, well, where's Greg? He's not here today. And the next day I said, Hey, what's up with Greg? He said, oh, well, he died. <laughs> well, what do you mean he died? Well, he drank himself to death. And it's like, oh. wow. I mean, anyway, that was a, a really a bad deal, but 
Speaking of New Mexico, I'm Elk Hunting. You were up uh, two weeks ago up here. I had a horrible trip. I wound up, I had heard that there was this one unit and I can't even remember the unit. It was like the most coveted unit there was ever to draw. And if I could get a tag, I was going to shoot a, a, you know, 380 plus. It was just an unbelievable area. So I applied. And at the time, uh, the, the, I, I, the old vice president for Gander Mountain, he applied. And, and the whole deal was, I, I said, Chris, if, if you draw a tag, I'll go with you. If I draw a tag, you go with me in case deal. So anyway, we put in knowing we're not going to draw. Well, Chris called me up. He goes, man, I got my tag. I said, no way. Oh. That, that's fantastic. And all of a sudden I checked and I got, I said, I got my tag. So we <laughs> both got a tag. Well, we were lied to. We were made to think this unit was supposed to be some kind of really good unit. So we wound up, we go on the trip and I took two camera guys. Okay. One to film me, one to film Chris. We showed up at the camp and it was a dump. I mean, it was really bad, but that's okay. Mm. As long as right. the elk hunting is good. I didn't know the elk hunting went any good. So there were no windows in the trailer where we spent the night. There was no water. There was no electricity. It was just an old busted up house trailer out in the middle of nowhere, but that's okay. I mean, we're going to go to this wonderful unit. Sounds like and, a deer and, camp I had in Oklahoma one year. Uh, oh, with well, this mice the, everywhere. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Well, the outfitter comes up, he goes, look, he said, I've got to run to town, which is forever away. And, and he says, the cook will be here in a little while. And so the house that the cook was staying in, we went in there and we waited and the, this lady shows up and this lady showed up, looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, big muscles up to her ears and like this, wearing a tank top. And she comes in and she's carrying groceries and had these nasty dogs with her and she puts them up. And I mean, I got the vice president of Gander Mountain sitting with me and two camera guys and we we're like, yeah, and she was the cook. Okay. And she had big tattoos on her arm and she was flexing for us like this. And anyway, it was just terrible. And she said, she said, if you leave me a good enough tip, I'm going to put the color in this one, just like this one. See that? And anyway, just awful. And it was like, oh my God, what have we gotten into? <laughs> that evening, she turned around, she walked into the room and she takes her shirt off, off the back. And she had a black scorpion on her back. Okay. Like this big. She was the most normal one in camp. Okay? <laughs> and it just got worse from there. And I'm, the next morning I'm up on this hillside thinking I'm in the most wonderful place to get a tag and all and the outfitter said nothing. And we're sitting there. I didn't smell any elk. I didn't hear any elk. I didn't see any sign of any elk. We're sitting there and I'm thinking, when's this guy going to talk? We're going to have some dialogue. It's about a relationship with an outfitter, you know? And all of a sudden he says, see that clearing down there? Went, yeah. Yeah. And he says, I had another hunter shoot a hunter right down there. Went, what? He said, what? yeah, he shot him right here. And I said, how? Right between the eyes. Oh, he, he says, it was somebody shot a bull and he went down there to pick it up and his buddy just thought he saw the horns move like that. So he shot him right there. I said, Oh my God, what did you do? He said, call the cops. Oh, I mean, it's the like, guy was dead. You know, yeah. The guy was dead. He shot him right there. Okay. Right between the eyes. It, I oh, mean, it's God. like some of these trips we go on are awful. I was in Zimbabwe and flew over there and in my very first trip to Zimbabwe, August of 99. And I didn't realize that those guys over there, they don't like the camera pointed at them. So I hadn't been in the country an hour, got out of the airport. And let me tell you something. When you, when at that gun safe behind you is the same color as those blacks over there. And there wasn't very many whites. And we stood out like a turd to punch bowl. And we're driving down the road in front of the president's palace. And I take a little video camera, stick it underneath my arm like this. And they had a little guy standing there with a, with a little old gun, you know, the automatic gun uh -huh. about every 50 feet. And they looked at me. And they saw me with the camera and he comes running over there. They open up the door at gunpoint like this, took me out and beat the crap out of me. And when, after they beat the crap out, I mean, the PH is yelling at gunpoint stuff. And I mean, it was bad, bad. <laughs> and I got back in the truck. I'm bleeding out of my mouth. And I mean, it was bad. And uh, PH goes, don't do that again. <laughs> okay. I won't do that again. I guarantee Thanks you. for the heads up. <laughs> yeah. Before so anyway, I I've gone yeah. on some real nightmare trips, but I've gone a lot of real good ones too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so that obviously getting your, your butt kicked in Zimbabwe by palace guards, uh, that might be worse than the, the guy dying in camp that just woke up uh, dead and didn't come to guide you. Um, I don't know. I'm trying to think of, there's certainly been ones where actually we gave away this hunt one time to, uh, we did a photo contest every month and we had the, the grand prize winner, our, our listeners and followers voted. And we went to this ranch in Southwest Texas and, we get there and there's no one to take us out. Like there's a ranch foreman. He's like, I'm not a guide. He's like, I just like feed the cows and stuff. 
And I was like, well, the owner, ranch owner was like, said someone's going to be here to take us out and cook and stuff. And he's like, yeah, th there's no one here to do that. He's like, let me call this other guy that lives in town and see if he'll come out here and, and deal with you guys. So this guy comes out and I think he was probably drunk the whole time too. Uh, there isn't a feeder on this property, which is like two, it's two or 3000 acres free range that none of them have been filled up with corn. And I have this guy and his wife that won the contest there hunting with me. I'm like, I don't even know what to tell these people. I'm on the phone with the owner being like, Wayne, what in the hell, dude? There isn't, there's nothing here. There's not a person to take us out. And it, it, even if there was, there's no feeders that have corn in them. Well, it turned into a spot and stock hunt, just driving around, hunting out of the truck. And somehow we each got a buck, but they weren't not like what, what this place was advertised at. I think that one's probably the, the worst one that I've been on. Uh, had a happy ending because we we tagged out but geez it was uh high expectations and no delivery on that thing see the the thing i tell people is that it's ask for references and call them okay and ask for references that were not successful not just those that were successful right but i always ask for references that were not successful and the reason why is because if they weren't successful and they still are a good reference you're going with a good guy Okay. I mean, like we just got back from Alaska. I've been with, I've been five times with this guy in Alaska and this guy is the most badass guy. You could, you couldn't ask for a better guy, but this trip was horrible mm. in the last five or six years. He's made some poor life decisions and it reflected in, in every single thing that we did. And uh, I mean, everything. And we, uh, and we went up there, there was no food in camp. There was no, and this we're talking about, we rode two days horseback to get into camp. There was no food. There was no water. There was no propane. Mm. There was no nothing. And the reason why is because the other hunters had flown in there and stolen everything out of his camp. Okay. But he could have corrected that by knowing by going up there ahead of time and making sure that everything was still there before we went up. And then, and then everything that could, I look at it this way, a good outfitter is somebody that controls everything he can control. Mm -hmm. Okay. From the lodging to the transportation, to the hunting blinds, to the feeders going off, right. Everything he can, can control. I mean, there are things we can't control the weather, you know, is the biggest thing and the animals we can't control, but the things that we can control, if we don't control them or the outfitters don't control them, then shame on them and shame on us to continue to go back with them. Mm -hmm. So, so would you go back with that guy? Nope. Oh, he asked me, he said, Hey, you know, anytime you want to come back, come on back. And this was about eight hours after the bush pilot was supposed to be there. That wasn't ever called to come pick us up. Wow. Yeah. It, so it, when it, I found out all this, it's like, you know what? It, it told me that he didn't respect us at a, enough. And plus the one thing that really got me, he never said the two words that I think that would have really changed things. I'm sorry. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, we all make mistakes, you know, but if he would have just said, I'm sorry, I could have done better you know, and addressed it instead. He just blew it off. It's like, uh, that wasn't good for us. We, uh, we kicked a guy off of our deer lease two years ago because he did, he did not say those words. We had a year and a half year old, maybe two and a half. It was a very young buck, but he had a drop time. We've never seen a drop time buck on our place in, um, Clay County up around Wichita falls. Well, we said, okay, everyone see these pictures. We have lots of pictures of this buck. No one shoot him. We all agree. Yes. Okay. Group text. Everyone agrees. A guy drives down from Houston. He's got his teenage daughter with him. First afternoon, opening day, she smokes that deer. And, they, and he'd already been texting that they watched that deer all morning, that morning. I mean, he knew what that deer looked like. And he just was like, well, it'll be my daughter's first buck. And yeah, of course, we're all happy that his daughter shot the first, her first deer, even though it was a, you know, it could have been a 160 in three or four years with the drop time. But she smoked mm -hmm. him. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. But he didn't ever say, first of all, he didn't even send the picture to the group text, which whenever something gets shot, everyone sends pictures, never addressed it. The other guy that was in camp with him was like, well, the deer got shot, but y'all aren't going to be happy about which one it was. He sends the picture. This dude never even addressed it, never said he was sorry, no, nothing. No, I'm sorry, guys, we, we shot the wrong deer on accident. No, nothing. So the landowner and I were just like, well, screw this guy. At the end of the season, he can get his crap off here and go on about his you life. Know, it's horrible because you think he stole from the future is the way I look at that. Mm -hmm. You know, those are, those are genetics that you want to see over and over again. And I know it's really hard. It takes somebody's mature and disciplined to say, I'm not going to shoot that deer. Cause it could be the biggest year they've ever seen, but a deal's a deal. And when you get on a deer lease or you get on a, a you go with an outfitter, you know, you've got rules, you've got expectations and a deal's a deal. Okay. Yeah. And when you, and, and people do make mistakes, 
But when you make a mistake, you should, you know, you should make it right. And the first part of making it right is admitting that you made a mistake and saying, I'm sorry. Now, what do we need to do to make it right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've, I've certainly shot the wrong deer before. Um, not intentionally, but the words, I'm sorry, were the first things that came out of my mouth, you know? Yeah, uh, you bet. It was, uh, it, this was when I first started hunting and I had really no idea what I was doing. And my buddy drops me off in a blind in South Texas. And he's like, all right, you're going to see more deer than you've ever seen. I'm used to hunting in North Texas. If we see four deer in a set, that's a great set. He's like, you're going to see like 30 deer. Okay. He's like, shoot the one with the orange ear tags. And this is a 4,000 acre lease in Webb County. That's not high fence. And I said, why does this deer have ear, ear tags? And uh, he's like, oh, the neighboring ranch is doing some age survey structure. Well, this 10 point walks out. I'm like, orange ear tags. Boom. Smoke this buck. I'm so excited. I was like, I shot the biggest deer of my life. And it was, it ended up being like 142 inch, four and a half year old buck. And my buddy comes over, he comes to pick me up. I sent him the picture first of all. He's like, Oh, that's not the right one. I was like, You said shoot the one with the orange ear tags. This is the one that walked out. This is the one that got shot. He's like, yeah, that's not, uh, that's not the one I was thinking of. He was, there was another one, like a little six or eight point <laughs> that I was supposed to shoot. Well, his dad luckily was, you know, guy that I'd gone fishing with and we were good college buddies, his son and I, and he didn't give me too much crap about it. But I think I, I think I sent him like a, a nice handgun as an apology for shooting this <laughs> $4,000 deer. But, uh, but it turned out Dr. Deer was doing, I guess had a lease on the next property over. And I had, I was interviewing him like a couple of years later. And I told him this story. He's like, I guarantee you I have a picture of that buck as a yearling because he was in my survey. And he sends me a picture, and that thing was the most worthless-looking spike that you would ever imagine. Did you, okay, did, did you see that survey James did? Uh, that was a, that, okay. That was the deal. I'm telling you, or Doctor Deer. Okay, yeah. I've known James Kroll for uh, forever, and he did that survey. They went to South Texas, and they had all these students were taking thousands of game cam picks and tracking these deer from uh -huh. yearlings to two to three to four, and some deer just were horrible they were genetically horrible and they just got older and they were still horrible you know yeah. just, but yeah. it was interesting to see that to, to see that progress through and i thought james knows his stuff clearly but i was yeah. going to tell you a, a story uh we went to alaska i could not wait to go to alaska on this bear hunt it's like oh it's gonna be cool i took my son on that too and we went up there and we 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 had a good time and all and then they i said look we want to stay until black dark and we're hunting spring bear and it doesn't get dark up there until like 11 o'clock and it kind of right. it doesn't really get dark but i mean they, you come pick us up after that because your grizzly bears up there too okay so anyway we hunted till 11 o'clock and i didn't hear the boat and 12 o'clock and i didn't hear the boat and 12 30 didn't hear the boat come to get us and they didn't come get us they just flat <laughs> didn't come get us it's like and and so i got out of the tree it got cold i mean i was running up and down the gravel bar thinking if a grizzly bear is going to be over here fishing, he's going to eat, he's going to find a big white guy that he's going to eat, you know? Yeah. It's like, no, no. So anyway, I wound up the next day when they came to get me, boy, they said, they, I said, what happened to y'all? They said, we got hung up at the bar. I said, what? The bar? And they really went to the bar. I thought they got hung up on a gravel bar trying to come get me though. They went to the bar and they just, wow. they just forgot me. So. Yeah. And you just spent the night out there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was cold and pissed, and anyway, I'm not going back with that outfitter either. Oh uh, man, yeah, that's. Uh... But then, you talk about a, a tag deal. Let me tell you this: I got invited to go to a high fence place up in Wisconsin, go bow hunt years ago, and I asked the guy. I said, "Look, we're making a show." I said, "What do you not want me to shoot? What is off limits?" He thought you shoot anything you want. I said, "No, no, 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 no. I don't. It's okay. I don't have to kill a big deer. I mean, yeah. just I want to shoot a mature deer. Just tell me what I can't shoot." He said, "Anything." Okay, fine. And it was 2,000 acres. It, it looked like Idaho, big hills, beautiful timber. I go up there and I smoked a buck at 12 yards. He came in and boy, I shot the arrow through him and he went over there, died. And, and when I went over there to recover him, he had an ear tag in his ear and it had a little yellow ear tag with the number one on it. I thought, huh, oh, but the hell of a deer, you know? I, man, I mean, the video was unbelievable. So I called him up on the radio and I said, hey, man, I just killed a deer. I need you to come help get it out. Mm -hmm. and he comes over there where is it i said right up the hill and anyway he went up looked at it and i was getting my gear together with the cameraman and he came back he said you need to leave i said why 
He says, you shot buck number one. I said, yeah, I know. I saw what number one was in his ear. He said, but you shot buck number one. I said, well, you told me I could shoot any deer I wanted. He said, but you shot buck number one. I said, but you told me I could shoot any deer right. I wanted. He says, that was my number one breeder buck. And you just shot him. I said, but you told me I could shoot him. He says, he got out of the pen. It wasn't supposed to be in there. Well, that's <laughs> not your fault. I know that, but he, anyway, uh, we, we kissed and made up. I told him, I'm sorry. You know, so we kissed and made up and he's hanging on the wall in my office. So <laughs> <laughs> did you see the, um, the kid in, I think it was, oh, I was Nebraska or Kansas that shot yes, yes. that deer. So he, I, I don't know the, what really happened, but in his comments on Facebook, he made it sound like the high fence ranch was 10 miles away. I ended up talking to a guy that lives there. He's like, no, the ranch is like the next property over. Yeah. So it, the kid's story isn't really adding up. But do you fault the kid for shooting the buck that got out? It's yeah, hard okay. to say. Here, you know, there's a lot because I support all hunting. High fence, low fence, no fence, yeah. I do it all. Okay. I could care less. I mean, I support all hunters. And, and so, but there's some hunters say, I wouldn't hunt in a high fence, blah, blah, blah. And I think, why is that? Are they just jealous or they, I mean, they just are, they're purists to the point they just won't. That's cool. Whatever the reason why, but the truth of the matter is, I think that if that big buck walked by you and it, that came out of a high fence and a hunter doesn't shoot him because, oh, he's too big or this or that, I think that's when you really find out what somebody's made of, you know, and that yeah. kid, I would, I don't blame him for shooting that deer. I'd have shot that deer. Right. A hundred percent. Yeah. I would too. I would too. Now, if the, if the, well, there's just people like, why didn't he just call the landowner? Well, once the, once it's out of the pen, what are you going to do? Go dart it and like, put it back in there. I, I pretty much once it's free range, it's free range. Yeah. Once it's, once it's out, it's like, it's out. <laughs> once buck number one's out, he's out. So that's right. And now he's on my wall. Yeah. Yeah. And that kid will have a nice 250 inch buck on his wall too. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't get the high fence thing either for me personally. I have, I've killed a lot of animals in high fences. The ones that mean the most to me weren't killed on a high fence. I'll throw that out there, but I still, I still like the experience. Hell, I go to Africa, 30,000 acres. If you want to call that a high fence, yeah, technically it's a high fence. I call it a game preserve, yeah. but yep. you'll never well, see you the fence what? except for when you drive in. It, it is. Yeah, exactly. And then think about it is, is a lot of people don't really realize that. And it doesn't matter to some people, to some people it does. And I think hunters are their own biggest enemy when they start this infighting, you know, bow hunting's better than this or hunting over a feeder is bad because literally there are people, I mean, during this conversation, you said something like that. You, you took those winners of that contest out to a ranch and the feeders weren't full and somebody, I mean, that's not fair chase to somebody. Somebody, right. well, you know, you got feeders. That's not fair chase. Well, is having a scope on the high powered rifle fair chase? Mm -hmm. I mean, seriously. I mean, if you, yeah, I, you've hunted deer in the Midwest. Yeah. So, so here's, here's my analogy for that. People want to say, oh, you Texans use feeders. Well, okay, go to South Texas and try to see a deer without cutting a Sendero and putting a feeder out. Try yep. it, try it. But yep. yet, yet, here you are, or here I was, muzzleloader season, Pike County, Illinois. I'm sitting in a box blind looking over 10 acres of manipulated um, soybeans. Manipulated. The, the outfitter buys X number of acres from the farmer. He says, please leave this up for my deer hunters. Mm -hmm. I could reach out with that smoke pole and touch every corner of the 10 yep. acres. Kill any deer in there. Mm -hmm. It's a feeder. It's a food right. source. What's the difference? Just because it's bigger? Right. You, you want to judge us? I'm like, okay, now if you're out spot and stock only out Western guy, maybe you have some ground to stand on but these if you're a midwest hunter and you're and you're hunting over a food plot you're going to judge someone in texas over hunting over a feeder it's the same damn thing see and that's where where i look at it, i think you know what that's the reason why it's like if you're a hunter no matter what you hunt i look at it, i look for that common thread that unites us that right. brings us all together you know the, and, and i think i don't want to look for things that divide us god knows we live in a world now that we're, they're trying to divide us up with everything that there is anyway it's like wait a minute we need to unite you know we're hunters and we may disagree and say you know i think bucks are better than ducks or elk are better than turkeys or whatever that's cool but right. you know what we just need to stop this bashing each other and because and we ought to treat each other more respectfully with those choices we have those choices to be able to hunt and it's like you know my dad years ago he he was what i called a purist and he went uh, I mean, he hunted out West and would never hunt in a high fence, never hunt with a feeder and all. Well, he retired and he came back to Texas. And uh, when he came, he, he, he uh, hunted for two years at, uh, down South Texas without a feeder. 
And he called me up. He said, son, do you think he could get me a, a deal on one of those corn spinners? And I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> he says, a corn spinner feeder. And I said, wait a minute. You told me you'd never hunt with one. He goes, I don't know how you're going to attract any deer without one down there. Yeah. I said, hmm. Uh -huh. So it's real easy for people to criticize until they step in somebody else's shoes, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, let's, as we wrap this up, Keith, what about gratuity? I don't, I think a lot of people are confused on, you know, you go on an, a, a guided hunt. What is, um, what is an acceptable gratuity? And that's going to change. Like, okay, if you go on a $200 guided, uh, duck hunt, eh, I'm going to give the guy 50 bucks, you know, that's probably what I'm going to do. Um, that's a good question. It's something that I believe, I mean, I've been doing this a long time. I believe that you, uh, people that work in a hunting camp aren't just always your guide. Okay. They're, they're cooks and they're people that are cleaning. There's somebody that went and bought everything. There's, there's all these other people that are involved in making your dream hunt come true. Mm -hmm. And it's important that I think you compensate those people. Okay. Yeah. They get paid, but I think it's important that you pay that you, you compensate those people. And if you want to go back into that outfit, if you don't compensate those people and you go back, how do you think they're going to treat you next time? Right. You stiff them. Okay. Mm -hmm. How do you think they're going to treat you? Okay. So it's for that reason that I always want to step up and I, and I don't want to call myself a big tipper, but I do tip and I do encourage people to tip. And I look at, I think a 10% tip, I think is, is, is reasonable. I right. think it should yeah. be expected. I think it's something that, that, uh, that if you don't have that in your budget, when you plan one of these dream hunts with these big hunts, I think that maybe you ought to try to figure put that in your budget because yeah. it, you know, that's the way it is a dream hunt. I, I tell people like when they come to hunt at my ranch, I look at these people, I've never been on a cruise and I don't want to go on a cruise, but I know that people that do go on a cruise have their butts kissed. Okay. I mean, they, they have everything taken care of for them from the time they get there to the time they leave. Well, you know what, as a hunting outfitter, we need to kiss our hunters butts because they can go lots of places and kill, and kill ducks or bucks or elk or anything else. And so if you want those as an outfitter, you want those people to come back to you, you do everything that you can to make their experience enjoyable and successful. Okay. And it takes time and money and it, and it takes support, support staff. And so when you have hunters show up that don't tip, it doesn't do good. It's just not, it's just not the right thing to do. It's like going to a restaurant and getting good service and not getting, not tipping somebody. I don't believe in that. Let me ask you this. So, um, when I was in New Mexico two weeks ago, my, my guide, I was asking him about tipping and I already knew what I was going to give him, you know, mm -hmm. um, it's always between 10 and 20%, just depending on how the hunt goes and how hard they work. Mm -hmm. Um, but I asked him, I said, so tell me about like one of your worst, one of the worst experiences you've had with a hunter who like just stiffs you. And he goes, well, the first day of, uh, the first archery season, I put a guy on a 340 inch bull. He smoked it done deal. Gave me 200 bucks. And I was like, wow. Okay. So that brings into question. So you tag out on the first day and you have the, you get your animal of a lifetime. Then do you just forget about the other five or six days? Uh, how X number of days your hunt was? Um, what do you, what about that situation? Okay. Every deal is different. And uh -huh. I think that you've got to have a good relationship with your outfitter if you want to go back. Okay. And, and so, you know, you pay for a five day hunt. Does that mean you get to stay five days after you kill the animal? I mean, you can, you stay those four extra days. Okay. I know that when people come to my place to kill the first day, if they want to stay, we take care of them and I take extra care of them because I want to make sure and show them other animals that the way they want to come back. Right. Okay. I want to take care of those people. There's, they could make a decision to go hunt any place. I want them to make a decision to come hunt with me. And I think any outfitter, it's easier to keep a customer happy, regardless of whatever business you're in, than to go out and get a new customer. And so it's for that reason, as an outfitter, I look at, I want to keep my people happy. And the outfits that we deal with, for the most part, they want to keep their hunters happy. And so it's for that reason, I tell people, check references. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I would say if I, if I got, if I shot the bull of a lifetime on the first day, I'd, I'd give the guy probably maybe more than what I was going to give him. If he put me on a 340, you better bull, believe it. You know? Because like, if you think about this, how lucky you are. I mean, it, it, it's just like, I don't know. A lot of people just take things for granted, Yeah. you know, and, and it's like, okay, 200 bucks won't fill up a truck and take your family to dinner. Right. Right. I mean, come on. Yeah. You know, yeah. come on. I mean, it's just like, 
you know, we've had hunters show up at the ranch and for whatever reason. And I don't that was know a $5,000 hunt, let's just say. And the guy gave him 200 bucks and shot the, the bull of a lifetime. So le- way less so than that, 10%. Probably if, if, it, if he killed on the first day, I would think $1,000 would probably be a pretty good sign that, well, you know what? Yeah. I want to come back next year and put me on another one the first day and you got your thousand dollars <laughs> again. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I, I, I've just been in those situations, even with my buddies, they're asking me, Hey, what should I give this? Whether it's a duck guide, you know, for one morning, or certainly when I take a group to Africa that we have that conversation before we leave, Hey, what's a, what's a good tip for these guys. And, you know, but get this, I, I do encourage people to think money is a whole lot better. I mean, it's harder to come by than a lot of hunting gear but there's a lot of guys that just leave binoculars. You know, they'll leave a hunting knife. Here you go. It's like, come on, what guy needs another knife? Right. <laughs> the only another- exception to that is the trackers in Africa love to have long blades. I mean, that's like, Oh yeah. Oh uh, yeah. But I still give them, you know, X number of dollars. Um, yeah. As well as appreciation. That's just a bonus here. Yep. Um, so, well, awesome. Hey, Keith, where can folks find uh, you, the high road um, TV show, social media, we're uh we're on we're on the pursuit channel and uh it's called high road the high road and uh, we are three times a week 52 weeks a year uh our niche on on our television show while other people have niches our niches we don't have a niche we hunt we hunt all different forms and methods and all different species uh we're also on youtube have close to six hundred thousand subscribers on youtube go to youtube hit high road hunting we do stuff on there uh we're across a lot of digital platforms of course we're on facebook and uh, Instagram, and those are the best ways to find us. Awesome. Well, hey, congrats on your successful hunt in New Mexico, and uh, thanks for making time for us today. Certainly appreciate it. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much. All right, safe travels. All right, take care.